the difference between a site where you've got trade union organisation and the shop stewards continually going to management with issues of safety and the management here were pleased to see it, immediately deal with it. But where you've got a job which is full of the lump where they're working in small units, the men are literally working for a small employer, then they're allotting to themselves. They don't care whether there's a, a tow board missing from here or a handrail missing up there. That means work to replace it. And their, their attitude is, well, that's not my job, that's somebody else's. Let me get on with the job of earning a lump sum payment, you see. And of course, the whole situation of safety deteriorates where the lump labour is operating. And I'll give you an example of that. You see, we've got, in the building industry, more than a death a day. More than a death a day. It's literally a bloodbath. We have 30,000 registered accidents a year, and last year there was over 200 deaths. Last year, there was just under 30,000 registered accidents. But of course, this isn't the overall total because the uh, thousands of workers who work self-employed and on the lump, they don't register accidents on the job, uh, which means that the sum total is far in excess of this. Yeah. Now, I'll give you an idea of what accidents take place. For instance, take the scaffold here. If there's no safety rail, if there's no tow board, the safety rail is obviously to stop anybody going over, right? The tow board is for the purpose of stopping anybody slipping and, and rolling over the side. Now then also, it stops material. Now you'll note the material along the scaffold. It means in effect that any one of the lads could kick a brick over the top, or a tool or anything like that, and the lad below could be hit, you see. Well, that's in the majority of cases, if it, hits on a, if it lands on an unprotected head, it means death. Now then, these are only one of the hundreds of hazards that are on, on a building site. And that's why it's important for not only strong trade union organisation, but vigilant, vigilant trade union organisation, in order to see to it that everything is in order. Now then, of course, the employers do not agree with trade union organisation in the building industry. They pay lip service to it. Because if they can cut corners on the safety regulations, they can save themselves literally thousands of pounds on a single job. Well, of course, the other thing you have is, I mean, if you're up two or three hundred feet in the air, the employer still expects the same amount of production as you would on the ground level. And, of course, there are greater dangers up there. The wind, for example, rain, snow and ice, all the different conditions affect the building workers. Well, there was 2,358 lads killed in this industry in the last 10 years. Now, one of them was recently killed only three weeks ago before Christmas, working in a tower crane. The tower crane collapses, and when we inspect it, we find that the, one of the main staunches has been defective, if not weeks, months. So, therefore, there hasn't been a regular safety inspection. But the point that I want to emphasize is that her widow, in making a claim for compensation, she'll have to fight tooth and nail against the, comp against the insurance company, and the maximum the firm can receive in fines for negligence is £100. And that's what it's worth to a building trade worker. That's what his life's worth, £100. quite a, a problem concerning uh, the strike. We knew that we had two thirds of the industry that weren't in a trade union movement, and we knew that we had one hell of a problem on our hands. In the North Wales area, we had uh, more than the task of other areas because we had a, a very uneven share of lumpers and non-unionists, etc., and a very sparse on the ground as regards to active trade unionists. So the, the number of active trade units being that small, the strain was tremendous. This was the start of the flying tickets in the North Wales area, and if you like, this was the start of all the events leading up to the two, three, uh, 24 lads being finally convicted.
we went on coaches, we went on cars up and down North Wales. Some 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 sites we, we, we'd meet blokes, um, we'd pull them up there, we'd then probably go around to another site the next day and we'd see them there, you know, and we'd pull them up again. There was some persistence. But in the main, a lot of them came up. There was never any trouble. I think at that point, Bob's making there, uh, there was, there was uh, quite a number of lumpers in the area, and they'd been out on strike at the request of the stewards. And I say at the request because, you, you know, if anyone who knows anything about the industry knows that you can't go and drag people off against the will. If we could have done this, by the way, we're not apologising, because if we could have done this, we'd have had better conditions for them many, many years ago. But the fact was that you just can't pull people off against the will. The only time we had any trouble was uh, on a couple of sites. One site in particular was up to the top side of Hollywood, site in Brentford to be exact, where where the lads approached the site, uh, the agent came out with his camera first of all, and the lad said, well, just put that away. Anyway, they took the camera off him. Next thing we knew, he'd gone back into the house and came out with a shotgun. I always we had to uh, act very quickly because if someone's got a shotgun point back, you don't know what the hell is in it. Anyway, we, got, we managed to get the gun off him, and uh, on further examination, we found that the cartridge inside, the bookshed had been taken out and had been filled up with grain. Now, according to people who know a bit about a gun, if that had gone off, and he'd all intention to be using it because he made that statement, this could have blinded people or to take them something terrible. Uh, this was reported to the police, and they said they would be taken further. But up to date, and that's going back 16 months, nothing whatsoever has been done about it. Having gone round these particular sites, the police had quite a, a, an easy task, because all they had to do, in fact, was follow the particular flying pickets, which they did do. The police went round, escorted them from site to site, and at no time made any arrests whatsoever. After the strike, a call went out from the National Federation of Building Trade Employers in here to all the members to help them compile a dossier on the flying tickets. Then the employers brought pressure to bear on the home secretary to backbench Tory MPs to arrest the 24 Shrewsbury building workers and make an example of them. There's nothing wrong with the law. The real problem is one of enforcement. Following the disturbing evidence of intimidation from many areas during the national building strike, I intend, once again, to draw the attention of my peace constables to the provisions of the law and discuss with them what further action they might take. For three months after the end of the strike, the police started making inquiries and a number of our brothers were taken down to the local police station and were held there for four to five hours, interrogated uh, in various ways. Uh, some were threatened that uh, when they finally got the charge sheet out, it would read worse, and that's the crate win. When they finally did come for me, they'd have a charge ready for me, which would probably land, land me in jail for the minimum two years and probably up to life, you know, like this last. The key incident, which was made the excuse for the trial, occurred on a McAlpine site in Telford. The High Sheriff of Denbyshire and controller of the police force which brought the charges is a McAlpine's director and Sir Alfred McAlpine's son-in-law, Peter Bell. Sir Alfred McAlpine is himself a past High Sheriff of the county. This house in North Wales goes with the job.
my husband states that if you use violence, you can't express the backing of the men. And yet the judge pronounced him a violent and a vicious man, which to my mind is pure spite. Viciousness on his part, because he had no proof of it at all. He didn't know Dennis from Adam. But if they're allowed to get away with it now, and these men remain in jail, there's not much future for our children when they start work, because there isn't going to be a trade union. And without a trade union, they become, as we are fast becoming now, a fascist state. This is supposed to be a democracy, a democratic country. And as a dem democratic country, how can my husband be a criminal because he still has for his rights and the rights of his fellow men? It just isn't true, is it? It isn't a democratic country at all. There's no such thing as freedom of speech. Not here. And not now. It's awe inspiring, really, having never had anything to do with prisons before. I don't think I've even taken a second glance at the prison before. The clanking gates, clanging gates, and keys, and being shown through several doors before you eventually get to the appointed meeting place. It's very um, difficult to speak to your husband surrounded by policemen and guards and other prisoners and their wives and families. in your mind about the government, I, I never dreamt that such a thing would happen. The case was political, definitely political, because the start of the trial, there was at least a thousand policemen all around the court. Mm -hmm. And when we went around the back to park our car, there must have been 15 or 20 policemen with dogs around the back. So it must, it, it has to be a, a political case, otherwise there would be too many, so much police knocking around. Dad wanted to go in, and his uncle was with us, but they wouldn't let any one. And yet when we got in the car, there was plenty of people, when there was more policemen, then, uh, for, you know... The court was full of police inside full the Full of police. There was a conspiracy up there. Yeah. There was a conspiracy on this issue, but it was with Edward Heath, Robert Carr, and the police. And that is my belief, and I will, nothing will ever alter that on my mind. All of their good mates, all the lads from this area, are solid, like, behind them, you know, all the contractors. There's other parts of the country that uh, may not know what transpired because uh, Without you dealing with these things, you, you, you wouldn't believe that such things happen. Every building worker in the country has had a rise in their wages through this strike on the picketing. And I hope that they stand by these boys and get them relief. My son has got to be nine months jail for peaceful picketing, done no, no wrong in our eyes, done nobody any harm, done no destructive nothing or done any harm to anyone. All he has done is distributed 10 shillings per man on the site for a bag of chips and a packet of cigarettes. It's as simple as that. So you got anything to add that to that, haven't you? No, my son's been wrongly convicted. Thank you. 
two points, now say this. On conspiracy, you had your democratic rights stripped away from you. That's the citizens of this nation. Because this meeting, or any other meeting, can be classified by the legal beavers as a conspiracy. Secondly, on the question of a lawful assembly, every picket line, every group of workers can now be picked off by the legal board on the basis of unlawful assembly. Third, on the subject matter, causing an affair. That is a simple one. Stick an agent provocateur in the trade union movement from the special branch or receiving their advice from the influx of the CIA into this country, it'll not be the agent provocateur that is charged. It will be the leader, the shop steward of the given group of workers. They will try to behead the movement. And this is what the Shrewsbury trial is all about. The sentence passed at Shrewsbury is a challenge and threat to the whole labour movement. It does mean that in future, any workers that get involved in industrial disputes, strikes, future pickets, are all liable to be brought before the law courts. They're liable to have similar sentences passed against them. They're liable to end up in the same jails as what the lads are from the building workers dispute in 1972. Therefore, this is a challenge to the whole labour movement. Building workers are obviously the guinea pigs and are being used to intimidate and frighten you other workers. And uh, we call upon you to see this as a threat to you as well as to us to join in our fight to release these lads, to join in the fight to ensure that the lads are not only released but all charges are dropped against them, that in itself is a victory. But we have to go one further, and that is we must demand that the 1875 Conspiracy Act be removed and not allowed to be used against trade unionists involved in struggle. Dick Working Man 